Mina damer och herrar får vi presentera två av världens bästa författare, båda för en dag på besök i Stockholm. De är hitlockade av sitt svenska bokförlag som just fyller tio år. Vi har bjudit in dem till vår studio på vinst och förlust och hoppas på att få dem att samtala med varandra. Isak Barsevi Singer och Anthony Burgess. Här träffas de nu för första gången. Två så olika författare. Vad har de att säga varandra? Singer, en ödmjuk och vänlig liten herre, nyss fyllda 81. Burgess, en arg ung man, strax under 70. Singer med judendomens hela börda och lätthet på sina axlar. Burgess, en motsträvig katolik. Dorothea Bromberg, deras svenska förläggare, har varnat oss. Och Singer är lätt förskräckt. Nyss viskade han en smula generat. I'm afraid I have nothing to say to this man. Hur ska det här gå? You speak Polish with Dorothea? I, I, I have forgotten Polish. I haven't spoken it for 50 years. That's a long time. Yeah. But uh, Dorothea speaks many languages. Oh, she, she speaks uh, Polish. She was brought up. I'm a delightful girl, delightful girl. The most delightful publisher I have. I think Dorothea. Oh, she, I think she's good. I think she's very good. Mm. Don't don't ask me questions which I, I cannot answer you because all this culture I, I only I'm only I only know my little nook you know Yiddish and so on. So if you want to ask other kind of questions, best uh, better ask Mr. Burgess yes. because. He is a, a man of... Oh, well, you're kind, but yeah. I don't know... No, I, I, don't know I know, I he, knows, he knows a lot. The best thing is ask me about Yiddish, about Hebrew, about... Uh, I, I know nothing else. I, think, I, I, I would have thought it was a good thing to talk about the Yiddish language. Uh, well, yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, these, I, are, I would these, have so. these are the things which I really know. If you go into other things... <laughs> because it's a, an interesting language, and of course it yeah. has uh, connections well, yes. with the Germanic language. Yes, so, like some like connections, yes. And, uh, hmm. Um, yes, that's it. That's what I heard in the car. You started yeah. talking about Yiddish and Hebrew. Yeah, right. and, and our, our materials are language, you see. As writers, we use language. That's no, right. that, you, those you, are our materials. You, you really know a lot. That's not for ourselves. Yeah. But it's true, though. You know it? a lot, and I, I'm kind of a... Yes. No, not I know really. only my little environment and... Uh, it's a big one, no, it's a big one. Yeah, 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 so, anyway, I'll leave you now. Do I leave and, you? And you could stay, because we are, we are making... Uh, I'm making questions about oh, see, translations, yeah. and that's... Uh, um, yeah. Uh, yes. Questions you both... Uh, oh, yes. Right, yes, in, yes, right. Uh, uh, recently there was a, an interview with you in a, a Swedish uh, newspaper, yeah. A, a very good one, and uh, um, the final question was about your um, uh, your character. <laughs> the interviewer asked you what is the the main uh, uh, signs of your character or something, and your your answer was uh, compassion and rebellion. Do you yeah. remember? Yeah, I remember saying so. Yeah. Could you explain us a bit more about this answer? It's amazing. I have compassion with people and also animals since I am a vegetarian. And from my childhood, I, I, I suffered from this kind of compassion. I saw chickens slaughtered, or animals, and so on and so on. And rebellion is, I, I say to the Almighty, why did you create so much miserable? And I, I would say that these things always bother me from my childhood. And I think they bother everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm not a real exception in this, mm -hmm. in this respect. Mm -hmm. God is not good. It seems so from our yes. point of view, he seems to be sometimes good and sometimes terrible. Uh, he, he contains the devil. He contains the devil. Uh, I'm afraid so. Mm -hmm. This is how it looks. Mm -hmm. Although it's hard for me to believe that the creator of all the words should, should, be, should have the sometimes... 
the cruelty of a devil, but from our point of view, it looks so. So we rebel, we rebel against it. We say, since you have so much information, you are so great and so creative, why don't you have a little compassion, at least as little as I have? But he, he has his own ways. Mm -hmm. That is the answer. That is that is that is that is, uh, that it's is the only answer. answer. That is the answer. Of course. <laughs> no. That is what this book is about. Yes. <laughs> Although it's written by a Christian, it is a book about this Jew yeah. about the Jewish God. Yes. Hmm. May I, uh, before we go yes, yes. ahead, may I ask you, Mr. Burgess, yes. what's your dominant uh, mark in your character? Well, I, I would be happy to have Mr. Singer's two qualities. This. Compassion and rebellion. He, he, I think he's absolutely right. I think we, it's it's in, hi, uh, in I, him I, too. I think, I think we have, must have it if we're uh, if we're writers. Uh, if we if we take on the terrible burden of creating characters like God Himself and building up a world in words. I think we have to have this terrible compassion for people and for animals, for living things, and at the same time feel terribly angry. And uh, I think this anger is uh, characteristic of the. Big writers like Charles Dickens, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, this terrible anger that things are not better. It's the anger of Job, in a sense. It's in the book of Job. These questions you put to God, why? You get no answer. All that God says is, could you make a yeah, yeah. Could you do this? Well, that's, that's not the answer. No, I couldn't, but that's not the answer I want. Yeah. The answer I want is, why are things so wretched? Why are things so horrible? No answer comes. The Christians try to provide an answer. But I don't think it's a very successful one. In old age, I, I discovered it's not really a very successful one. Things are not explained. We do, still do not know why there's so much misery, so much torture, violence, tyranny. I suppose we write to try and find an answer, but with no success. I mean, um, I guess, uh, as I said, it's an odd idea to get you two here in the same studio, we're but we're there are close some... So we're close and so we're yeah. Yes, there yeah. are some questions anyway. I mean, you are both writers, uh -huh. and you are both fighting with the laws of life, as you would say. And, and sometimes, I, I, as a reader, I get the, the, the same uh, idea afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there must be a belief in a higher might or something. I think even Mr. Burgess, uh, that's what he says, yes, isn't I'll it? Yes, I would say that. Uh, and uh, Mr. B uh, Mr. Uh, Singer, you, you, you tell us uh, again and again that um, you must, there must be a belief uh, in a higher might. Those who deny the existence of God, they are in the hands of the evil. <coughs> I, <coughs> I still <coughs> I believe in God. I mean, I, I have a quarrel with him like everybody else, but I believe in him. Mm -hmm. I was never an atheist. Mm. No. And, uh, that is my position, that is my position. I mean, I was brought up as a Catholic in, in England, and uh, uh, our family knew persecution because England is a Protestant country. We, <coughs> I had an ancestor who was executed because he, really? say, he said the Queen, was not, the Queen Elizabeth I was not head of the church. We lost land, we lost money. We weren't even allowed an education until 1829, when we had the Catholic Emancipation Act. Mm -hmm. We couldn't go to universities. We, we've suffered. Uh, not as much as the Jews have suffered, but we've had our own share of suffering. But I've, I've, I've stayed true uh, to this concept of, uh, of God and uh, true also to the, uh, the tradition in which my family suffered. <laughs> but uh, I'm not satisfied. Uh, like Mr. Singer, I mean, I, I must go on. Ask, and yet, as a Catholic, I was taught to be frightened of God. Uh, we, we, we didn't have the privilege that you had of, of being able to argue with God, as Job does. And so it's only in, as I get older that I'm, I'm prepared to be bold and ask this question, why? Because no answer comes, but I still go and ask him the question. May I ask you where you were born and what city? I was born in Manchester, in, in, uh, in Manchester. the north of England. Oh, really? Uh, that explains my Lancashire accent. But uh, up in the northwest, we, we resisted the Reformation, you know, with the Henry VIII, uh, which... Um, took hold in the southern counties and in the middle counties. But in the north, we were always fighting against this, and we maintained the faith. Uh, and, of course, Irish blood got into the family to help the faith. Yet, uh, we've always had to struggle, uh, not only in terms of uh, uh, our spiritual lives, but also in terms of our economic lives. Because Catholics, they lost everything. They lost mm -hmm. their land. They, they lost their jobs. They, they couldn't enter the, the professions because 
you had to have a university degree to become a doctor or a lawyer. And we weren't allowed to go to universities. So uh, the family, my family, was also poor. And any talent we had uh, could only express itself in the simplest forms, like a stage. My mother was a dancer. My, my father played the piano in cinemas. And uh, this is a typical Catholic position in England. The, the great lawyers, the great doctors, the great uh, prime ministers, they all come from the south, and they're all Protestants, or as with Disraeli, they're Jews. Hmm. We never had a Catholic prime minister. Had yes. a Jewish prime minister, an Israeli. Oh, yes, you had. But uh, we've always had this, this problem. It still goes on. And he, he created an empire. <laughs> Indeed he did. Yes, yes. Great empire. <laughs> he had the vision. He had, he had oh, this, yes, he had this he's, vision. He's, he's gone here. His father is an Isaac. Uh, That's right, Isaac yes, Israeli. Yes. Isaac Israeli. Mm -hmm. So mm. there are similar backgrounds in a way. I mean... Mm. Yes, well, well, uh, yes, well, well, Mr. Singer very astutely asked the background. This, this, the background is necessary. You have to know the background. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Without mm. the background, there is no right. I mean, mm. there's no human being. <laughs> we all have a background mm. and roots, mm. whether mm. we like it or not. Mm. I, I, I was wondering, did they persecute your family? What, yes, what? we were persecuted. I, really? say, I say I had at least uh, one ancestor who was executed. He was burned, actually because he said the Queen was uh, not head of the church. He said the Pope is head of the church. So, for so, this... so that was it, you see. And later we had, uh, we had a certain amount of land in the north, and then this was taken away because we were not Protestant, you see. And if you, ent if you wanted to enter politics, you had to uh, undergo the, uh, the Test Act, which meant you had to be willing uh, to accept the Eucharist under the Anglican form, you had to take the bread and wine in the Anglican church and say, this is not the body and blood of Christ. This is merely a symbol. And if you wouldn't do that, you were, you were automatically a criminal. This went on for a long time, until 1829, which is not long ago. But not in your time. Not in my not time, but in my grandfather, in my great-grandfather's time. Yes. Well, I'm learning something. Mm. <laughs> Good. So, yeah, that's what, I, I mean, you are writers and you are both um, fighting with the mites and so on, and um, I guess Mr. Burgess is a more blasphemer sort, or really? would you agree? Really? I didn't know that. Uh, blasphemous, I don't know. No? Why did you say he was? I, I, maybe I don't pronounce it. You know, you pronounce it perfectly, but I'm just wondering that I was, I'm a blasphemer. Oh, I didn't know that. I, I said he was a blasphemer, maybe. It doesn't look to me like a blasphemer, um, but I mean, who knows how blasphemers uh, who knows, look who, like. Who knows who blasphemes? <laughs> uh, yes, I don't know. This is a good question, but uh, what do you mean by blasphemy? I don't know. Uh, let me start by... Uh, you told us uh, once about uh, Mr. Stravinsky. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Burgess uh, was in a film recently on the Swedish uh, television. Mm -hmm. and Stravinsky, you, you, you said something like he created a substitute of religion, um, uh, namely a, a very uh, severe, austere concept of art. Uh, yes, that's true. Um, so can well, one, I, I, can I one cre create a substitute of religion in that way? Well, I think what I was saying in that program was, is we were talking about two great artists who were both born in 1882. So I think that we must have done this program in 1982. Uh, there was Stravinsky and James Joyce. Uh, and I, I think I said that Joyce uh, was brought up a Catholic, as I was, but left it behind and had to create a substitute for the church he no longer believed in. And this was art. Uh, art uh, with Joyce is a kind of religion without God, in which there are very strict rules and uh, a great aesthetic ideal, but uh, God is not there anymore. He feels the absence of God, so he has to fill it in with the concept of art, which is almost religious. I think, that was, I think Stravinsky was pretty close to that, but Stravinsky believed in God all his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Joyce did not. Joyce was not sure. Can one, can one do a substitute? Can one recreate a, a substitute of religion? I do would think? say that worldly men try very hard to make worldliness into a religion because they speak with such enthusiasm as, about artists, about other people. To, to, to my parents, this looked like idolatry. Mm. And in a way, it looks to me like this, too. I don't think that art, really, no matter how great it is, can take the place of religion. It, it cannot. Mm. 
Uh, is it a question of, I mean, mankind must be helped to find uh, the reasons for morality, for moral, for instance. Is that why? Or? I would say that it, uh, the philosophers never really su succeeded in finding a real basis for religion, for, for, for and not for religion, for ethics, for morality. I mean, Spinoza tried, they all tried. Spinoza said, we have to be moral. If, you, if, you, if I am going to be good to you, you will be good to me. It's kind of a pragmatic or a practical way of looking at, at morality. My, my morality, if I have any, is based on rebellion. I see, I see, I say to God, you have all the information, all the knowledge, all the, all the power, I have nothing. But since I am a sufferer, and so are many of my uh, other people, I don't want to, to go in your ways and be cruel in addition to the other uh, shortcomings which I have. I, I, I don't think you can really base it on, base morality on, on rebellion, but it's, a, it's as good a basis as any other, because the others are as flimsy as this one is. Mm -hmm. That's very clear, that's very clear, that's very well, clear. Uh, very clear. I'm great. really glad to, to, to talk to, to both sound. of you. That's very sound, that's very clear. Are you comfortable, Mr. Yes, I, I'm, I'm comfortable. You are, I mean, good. Do you want me to go away while you talk to Mr. Singer? No. Uh, oh, stay right here. Well, I, yes. if, you, if, if you don't mind. I, no. I'd rather, but... Uh, why why but, uh, should you... Go? Well, I thought perhaps you'd prefer to a tete-a-tete. -tete. No, I, 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 I would tell you I, I like to hear what you have to oh, say. Oh, I'm very glad. Thank you. That's very kind. Mm. Good. Well, we stay together. We stay together. Oh, let's good. stay together. Very good. Um, so, let's go on about... Uh, um, yes, would... Would you uh, add something to what Mr. Singh said? Uh, it's very difficult. I, I don't think I can, you see. Uh, although uh, our religious uh, backgrounds are, are, in a sense, different. It's different. Uh, but uh, we, we come to the same conclusions, oh. which means that there must be a basis to all religions, which is uh, uh, fundamentally uh, uh, th these two qualities that Mr. Singer first mentioned. Uh, without compassion, we are nothing. I, mean, I think all Christianity tried to teach was compassion. I think also rebellion. I mean, Christ was a rebel, great rebel. But we've now presented him as a kind of meek uh, Dustin Hoffman kind of creature. I, I was think uh, T.S. Eliot was right. He said, Christ the tiger. He said, in the juvescence of the year came Christ the tiger to be divided, eaten and drunk. Uh, but uh, I, I've, that's always been my conception, that Christ was Jew. He was a Jewish tiger. Sure, he was certainly Jewish. And uh, in 2,000 years, he's not been understood. Uh, this is, again, is what the, thing, the kind of thing I've been writing about here. Uh, but um, I, people don't understand, of course, because they don't want to understand. The, uh, to, to use a technique of compassion, to use a technique of... to learn a technique of love is what Christ said. But nobody was willing to understand that. He said, we, we don't automatically love people. Uh. We don't automatically love them, but we must try and learn a technique of loving. Do you think that they ever really I think made an effort? I don't think anybody... But when Christ said, you know, <laughs> right, if, somebody <laughs> if somebody strikes you on the street, I want to hit the other. Yeah. This, is a tech, this is a game. It's a game. It's a technique. It's, it, uh, you, learn, it's a you learn tolerance it's a through a, a, an intellectual technique. Which, uh, it doesn't come from the heart. It comes from the brain. And I think that's what he was trying to say, but nobody wanted to listen. The most peculiar thing is that in the book of Psalms, he mm. mentions that, that the g good person gives the other cheek. Yes, so well, it, yes, it always goes... Yes. He's giving to his beta his, his cheek. It's, mm. it's in the, I, I, tra I translate it badly, but this is what... No, that's right, yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. yes. Something course, like this, yes. Because the, the remarkable thing about Christ is that he always goes... Everything he says has a justification in the existing book of the law. He says, he says things which are startlingly new, but they're all thoroughly orthodox, and, and you find a scriptural basis for everything he says. Christ was a Jew. Of course he was. They, they tried, uh, Hitler tried to turn him into a kind of, Chris, uh, into a kind of Gentile, kind of the, the, the illegitimate son of a, of a Roman centurion, but of course Christ was a Jew. And Christianity is, is, is a form of Judaism. I, I agree 100%. Uh, 
I would say that the reason why, why many Jews did not accept Christianity, I mean, there may be many reasons. One of the reasons is that they thought that what he preaches is almost impossible, really, ever to practice. Mm -hmm. And since it's impossible, they thought, why, why preach something which cannot be done? But what the Jews preach is also impossible to, to practice. All preaching is... is, is that's, it, that's impossible, too. Yeah, that's yeah. impossible, too. Of course, yes. it is. Yes. That is what uh, Peter was saying uh, in Jerusalem after the death of Christ. That we cannot... Uh, the, the Jews who had become Christians were saying, these new Gentiles who have become Christians, they must be circumcised and they must follow our dietary laws. And uh, Peter said, we find it so difficult. Why should we impose our difficulties on them? And I think that's where the split began, where, where the division began between the Jews and the Christians. Uh, the, the, attempt to put, the attempt to spread Christianity, of course, was a failure. Uh, this book records a failure, Paul's failure. He, couldn't, he, didn't, um, he didn't convert the Jews, so he tried to convert an easier people, the Gentiles. It was a failure. I think his disciples actually tried it more than he did. They tried, yes, but so? Paul was a yeah. big, oh, intel big yeah. intellectual. Yeah, Part yeah. of his trouble. Mm. A big intellectual, yes, without, without much compassion. Yeah. That's what you mean. You need compassion, not only... You can't, you can't do anything without it. No, of course. You can't. Let's go to your book, Mr. Burgess, The, 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 the Kingdom of the Wicked. Yes. Uh, uh, and let's uh, start by Mr. Um, your, the Emperor Tiberius. Uh, yes. He said something, I mean, he was a cruel one. <laughs> yes. Terrible. So it's terrible. Uh, person and uh, somewhere he, s he says something like um, this the pleasure of this the pleasures of the senses yes. um, is the only thing that can ease the torments of the uh, spirit of the, of the of the mind yes, yes. well of course that uh, uh, Tiberius did not say that in in historical fact that was said in a novel by Oscar Wilde uh, I think it was Lord Henry Wotton says to young Dorian Gray, said, the, pleasures of the, the, the torments of the soul can only be healed by the pleasures of the senses, and the torments of the senses can only be healed by the soul. Uh, the, the point about the book, uh, I, we, I, we don't want to discuss the book, but uh, this, is, this is a wonderful example of anachronism. Uh, I had a review of this book in England by a, la a professor of Latin who said, Mr. Burgess is wrong here and there. And there. And I said, the whole book is a mass of anachronisms. Uh, but uh, I was putting into the mouth of Tiberius uh, what was already there in an awful by Oscar Wilde. Uh, do, is that true? Do you, do you want to know whether that's true? I don't know whether it's true. I don't know whether it's true, but uh, the point I was trying to make is that we're all, we've always been aware of this division between the body and the, ner the nervous system and, the, and this, alt this other thing called the soul. Can they be brought together? Are they always fighting? Can they be reconciled? That was a question. I, I don't know any answer. I mean, as our program is called the, the Tribune of the Senses. <laughs> Tribune of the Senses? Yes. Yeah. I mean, Tribune of the, of the Senses. Senses. A very nice title. Well, <laughs> what is the Tribune of the Senses, if I may ask you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. can't answer. <laughs> it no, it's really it 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 good. It sounds good. It sounds good. He says it sounds good. It sounds good. Of course, they contribute something. The Senses, mm. they're not all uh, neutral. No, but I mean, um, to, to um, think, as uh, Mr. Tiberius did, mm. uh, that, uh, that, that leads to, to um, I don't know what, sodomy or whatever. Well, I, I think this was just uh, one of the big questions that were being raised in the time of Tiberius, the first century after the death of Christ, uh, mm. by the Stoics who were trying to find uh, some kind of philosophy without God, uh, on which they could base their lives. And um, Stoics were aware of the pains of the body, the agonies of the body, the agonies of the soul, and they tried to cultivate an attitude to life of total indifference, no compassion, uh, no re rebellion, but uh, a total indifference with a belief that there was some spark inside their soul which would survive the, the torment, the dissolution, the mess. I would say that Spinoza tried to create a God without compassion and without pity because he says it all the time that God has no, no emotions, 
So he, since he has no emotions, he can have no compassion. But it's, ter it's very difficult to accept something like this. A great power, great knowledge, knows everything, a great psychologist, and he has no compassion. He sees a little baby uh, burning in a, in a fire, in a, he sees nothing. Of course, the, the, the answer is, the, the, the terrible answer is, of course, that uh, uh, God has free will. God is a, is a free, is the only free of being. Course. And the, his greatest gift to humanity is this same freedom, which means that we're free to torture and to kill, and he won't interfere. It's a very unsatisfactory answer, but it's the answer that uh, many theologians give, I think. Uh, wh why, were, why were millions of Jews killed? Why didn't God intervene? Because the Nazis had free will and I could not stop them having free will. I could not intervene. He has given, uh, according to Jewish tradition, before God gave the human being uh, free will, he asked the advice of the angels. And they said, don't, don't go into this venture or adventure because you may regret it. More or less, the Talmud doesn't say he may regret it, but anyhow, the angel said so. But God did not listen to the angels, and they gave humanity free will, knowing that it's a dangerous weapon. It can work both ways, in a good way and a bad mm. way. So this is how the Talmud tries to explain the same thing, yes. but Mr. Burgess... No, well, it, 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 was, we, we don't have that delight. I, I, didn't know, I didn't know that delightful corollary to this. That's beautiful. Yes, it's uh, there. Uh, that, the God, that God yes. was uh, aware that he had to get somebody there. Yes, he knew that, that he's going... But this has been the big, uh, I th I, I, it seems to me this is the big problem. It's a theological problem, but it's also a social problem. We've had for many thousands of years, are we free or are we not free? Librium, I, th I think St. Augustine called it librum, uh, librum arbitrium, uh, the freedom of choice. Now, we had a British heretic called Palladius, uh, who at the time of St. Augustine said that uh, uh, man is not free, uh, man is predestined uh, to uh, be what he has to be because God knows everything. And this has been one of our problems. Are we free? If God knows everything, we cannot be free because he knows what we are going to do. Uh, I remember there was an Irish, an Irish Catholic writer called Sean of Ireland who was always worried about this problem. And one day in New York, he was in a taxi and he suddenly thought he had the solution that God loves mankind so much that he refuses to foresee their actions. I see. But when they have performed their actions, then he knows and it's, remembers that he always knew. It's, it's nice. It's, it's nice, nice idea, but we can't, yeah. prove, we can't but prove it. It is considered in philosophy and in religion a contradiction. If God ca can, can foresee everything, he knows already that, that someone is going to murder someone. And if so, why does the man commit a crime? Why do you, why do you put him into prison for killing if God has already known it? Uh, there is no answer. No. The, uh, they, they all decided that it is one of these contradictions which cannot be answered, and we have to accept them as they are. Of course, we have another problem, Mr. Singer. I don't know how far this comes into, into Jewish thinking. The, 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 the Christians, or the, the Catholic Christians, certainly, have always been very interested in original sin. Yes. They say that man, St. Augustine, taught, where man is born in sin because Adam committed the first sin of disobedience. This sin is passed on and we're all born in a state of sin. Um, Pelagius, our British heretic, said this is not true. Man is neutral. Man can choose good or evil. He is not predisposed to choose evil. And I feel that um, in politics, you know, the, the socialism and communism are based on this idea that we're, so we're totally free uh, to choose. And we're not predisposed to be bad. I think this is a political issue. Yeah, it's, totally. it's become a political issue. The socialists yeah. say we're totally good. Any, anything bad in man is caused by his environment. There, there's no yeah. predisposition to, to be evil. Which is, which is, well, I believe there is. I believe, which is a big, I believe there a is. big lie. A big I, lie. I believe there is a predisposition. I think the, the history of this century shows that we have a strong predisposition. We're bit, there's a built-in capacity to do wrong. The, if people who were born with the genes of, of a criminal, I mean, there are some cases we know that the father was a... a, a a murderer and the son and the grandson. There are cases where really it looks that people ha are not free at all, that their genes or what whatever you call them influence them to such a degree that they must do it. Again, it's ag always the same problem of, of, of uh, free will and, and, and 
predestination. predestination. Determination, yeah. Well, you see, you, c you can build a, a whole civilization on one or the other. Uh, I think the Swiss nation has built its civilization on the uh, idea that... Really? Well, I, I feel that uh, money automatically breeds. You can't stop it happening. It's predestined to breed. Therefore, you have banks. Uh, um, the human soul is like a watch. It's like a mechanism which you can foresee. Therefore, you make watches. And uh, strikes me as the whole... The whole Swiss psyche is, is built on this Calvinistic notion. I just, I just cut back from Switzerland. Yeah, if you, I would well, have yes. known this, I would tell it to them. Well, I think, I think, I think, you would tell it to I, them. Well, I, 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 I do occasionally. They, will not, they, have no, they have no sense of humor, so they, <laughs> no, they will not accept it. I'm married to a Swiss. You're married? Well, you, this is, well I don't, you're, your Swiss is different. <laughs> tell me, does he have a sense of humor? Yes. Well, yes. Great. So you see that they're always accept. That, that's why he's not living in Switzerland. <laughs> Well, there is no doubt, you see, that we're, we're, we're assuming, we're making an assumption that God exists. And I don't think it's possible to, to live without that assumption. I think the situation of the atheist is totally impossible. Uh, we're, this is something built into us, this, this notion of a creator who has a special relationship with us which he will not divulge, he will not tell us what it is, but he's there, he's there all right. And I, I'm, I'm inclined more and more to the Jewish position that... Uh, the uh, capacity for harm is, is contained inside God and is not uh, the property of another being called the devil. Mm -hmm. The Christians have, have always liked this dichotomy, this, this twofold image of God fighting the devil, which may have come perhaps from the Manichees, you know, in Persia, X fighting Y, yeah, or, yes, and yes. who is going to win? We don't know. We don't know who's going to win, but one of them will, will win. We must be on the side of the one we want to win. According to the Jewish point of view, Satan and God don't fight with each other. They're not really equal enough that they should fight. Satan knows that God is stronger than he. That God has created Satan so that he should help him uh, test men, yes. test men's strength. That is, a book, so that is the book of Job, isn't yeah, it? I yeah. think, yes. Mm -hmm. what, is, uh, what, is the, what is the name? What is the name Satanas? Satan, what does it mean? It means the, uh, not the enemy, what does it mean? I don't know what it means. It, uh, Satan is mentioned in the Bible, I think, only twice, or maybe three times. Once, Satan in, in, Satan in the Bible is... Is he the, uh, is he the tempter? He is the, he's, he, the Talmud says that he goes down and tempts, yes. and then he goes up and, 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 and in cure. Accuses. Accu the accuser. Yeah, he's both. The, 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 and the accuser. Yes. This is how the Talmud expresses. He goes down to earth and tempts people, say it's good to sin, uh, kill, do whatever you like. Then he goes up to the Almighty and he says, see what, he, what they are doing. So he's really yes. a vicious character. Yes. Uh, he's, a, I would call him a bad lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> a shyster lawyer. Yes, a real shyster. Mm -hmm. So there's no wonder there are torments in men's mind. And I wrote a book uh, 25 years ago uh, called A Clockwork Orange, which they made into a film. Uh, Stanley Kubrick made a film out of it. The film was fairly popular, but it was not well understood. Uh, the book was about uh, a boy, uh, Huayu, uh, the friend called him a, a young scoundrel, who uh, goes around robbing, killing and raping, ravaging, and the state catches him and takes him and says, right, we're going to remake you. We're going to use Pavlovian conditioning techniques so that you will respond to evil by, being, by feeling ill. So you, you, you will automatically desist from thinking bad thoughts. Well, you know you're going to be, you're going to start vomiting. And um, the idea of the book was to show this, this was far more wrong than uh, to do what this boy was doing, that uh, what they were doing was taking away from him uh, the capacity of free choice. This was not well understood when the film was made, but uh, people said, ah, you are on the side of violence. Uh, when the film was shown, I got telephone calls saying, there was a nun who was attacked by four boys. I was like, this is your fault. You I said, well, it's not my fault. I'm merely showing what happens, what life is like. And I'm merely saying that it's probably better to commit a bad thing, a bad act, than to be so conditioned by scientific techniques 
that you cannot do anything unless the state wants you to do it. Uh, this was not well understood, but I still believe it. I still believe that it's probably about the state. Does it? Uh, the state is the state. They, the state tends succeed? to. The state Did they succeed? In in, well, the book had two forms. In America, uh, there was the book was published without the final chapter. Uh -huh. uh, because the American publisher said, "We are very tough here. We can take uh, far more than you British can." Nice. So the book ends with this young man uh, being. Re deconditioned so that he becomes capable of performing these acts again. I see. But in my version, the British version, he grows up. He grows up. He realizes that violence is an aspect of youth. Now he has energy, but he's able to use it for creation. He's going to be a great musician. The Americans didn't want that. So we only had that in Europe. It's a terrible film. I couldn't. You saw the film? It. Yes. <laughs> you thought it was a bad film or thought um, it was a. No, I just couldn't. Uh, 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 Take it to me. I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't see oh. it. I, I just. Well, I didn't uh, like it too much. I mean, when I went to see it in New York, they wouldn't let me in. They said, mm. "This is not a film for old men." This is a film for young <laughs> I said, "Well, I wrote the thing. Oh, never mind. All right, we'll let you in." <laughs> but I, I was very worried at the time yeah. because, okay. because uh, people were not understanding. The, the film looked like a glorification mm. of violence. So I didn't mean that. I meant that violence is built into our nature, and we can't. Afford, we can't. We can't neglect it. We can't uh, pretend it's not there. But what about the storytelling in the future? Is it important? I'm sure that if literature is going to last, it will have to go back to storytelling or be storytelling. Uh, no, I would say no story, no novel, no, 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 no short story. And why, why do I have with storytelling? We all like to hear stories when people come together and they gossip, they always tell stories. It's the best kind of entertainment. Mm -hmm. The take away from literature, the storytelling, is, is, is a sheer, uh, ups, sheer nonsense. This is how I feel about it. The very fact that one has to talk about it and try to convince people that literature and storytelling go together looks to me already like, like uh, a paradox. Yes, 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 I agree. Well, the, 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 I was thinking of two uh, big novels, perhaps the two most influential novels of the century. One is Proust's uh, big novel, La Recherche du Temps Perdu, which is a couple of thousand pages. And there was James Joyce's Ulysses, and people said, our, at last we are liberated in the novel from the duty of telling a story. Tell a story. But, of course, if you look very carefully at those two books, you'll find that they're just as orthodox in their storytelling techniques, although they take longer about it. They move. I mean, Joyce's Ulysses is just set on a single day in Dublin. Nothing really happens. But everything is happening. There's a man, Mr. Bloom, there's a young poet, Stephen, and they, they are going to meet. And they're moving towards this all the time through the 700 pages, and finally then nothing happens. But there is a conclusion. They've met. They've made contact. People say, ah, here we have liberation from the necessity of having a plot. But there's a plot there as much as anything. I think in Proust also. I think it was a plot. As about Pr Proust? I think in Proust. I think, I think Proust. There is a story. Oh, there's, there's, there's a story. There it's is. It's a very complicated story. Very complicated. You story. have to look for it. You have to look. It's there, though. It's there. Yeah. Hmm. Now, may I ask you, uh, Mr. Singer, uh, as we have subjects, I told you, themes for our programs, and ecstasy is one of those themes. I would ask you, uh, ecstasy, is it good to be carried away by in ecstasy, or is it bad? Is it a religious feeling behind, or what well, is it? According to Spinoza, all emotions are bad. He considers emotions bad only when you adequate ideas, when you study mathematics or logic and so on. I think that without emotions, a human being would be a vegetable, no matter how, how educated he would be. As far as literature is concerned, it is it is the law of emotions. Most emotions play the biggest part in, in literature. As, as far as, as uh, the, the moralists, I would say that they considered our emotions uh, uh, very often a disturbance. That they, if someone insults you and you feel like killing him, it's, uh, they wouldn't say that this is a good kind of emotions. But why should you have such a, a bad emotion of trying to kill somebody or to imagine that you kill, you kill him? As far, as far as literature is concerned, without emotions, it disappears. Like without storytelling, like without emotions, and without ecstasy, it, it would disappear altogether. Well, you mentioned the word ecstasy, of course. It, uh, I, I was brought up to look at words and see what they really mean. Ecstasy means standing outside yourself, yes? 
No. Standing outside your cell. Do you mean this? Then yes, you that's mean, uh, what I mean. Carried, you, we've carried, carried away. Well, carried that, that, away. Mean, that means you're carried outside your own personality. Yes. Don't you think that ecstasy is, is, is uh, made up of emotions? Well, I think, it's, we, it's I, think emotion. uh, I think we tend to use the term. Uh, we rather cheapened the term, and uh, it, it's, it's come to mean uh, a very intense emotion of joy, usually, or even, indeed, of uh, d destructive passion. In an ecstasy of emotion, uh, he killed him, you know. In, an ex in the act of love, we're supposed to have the ecstatic phase in which you escape from your own personality and join with the personality of somebody else. I accept the term in that sense, but I, I can't accept it in the terms that it says of very high emotion, you know, the height of emotion. It seems to me a special state which is given to religious mystics, perhaps, so it's given to us in the act of love, in the act of hearing music or reading a great book. We get outside ourselves and, as it were, enter a new plane of being for a very short time. We can't sustain it for very long. Now, that's what I mean by it. But I know young people tend to use it very loosely and... Uh, pop music puts into, a, into an ecstasy of excitement. It's not quite that. Ecstasy is a very big thing. When a saint, you know, felt he was in contact with God, uh, there's ecstasy. That's the, real, that's the real thing. And the only parallel to that, I think, in, in ordinary day-to-day -day living is, is, the, is the sexual, uh, the sexual yeah, emotion. Yeah, which is an ecstasy. Uh, which, uh, unfortunately, doesn't last all our lives, but uh, lasts long enough <coughs> for us to know what it's like to get outside ourselves. Since I don't know, I didn't know very well the origin of the word. To, to, to me, ecstasy meant strong emotion, Most, uh, mostly in a positive way, but it can also be in a negative. When, when, so when is it in a positive way? It's like well, well, I, say, I would say a religious ecstasy. To me, even even uh, sexual ecstasy is not really evil. I don't. I never considered uh, sex uh, to be as bad as uh, as our moralist uh, preach about. Well, we've we've always. I think most um, cultures are, are frightened of sex, uh, chiefly because it uh, does take you to a. Uh, to a, a place, it, it puts you in a, in a situation uh, where you're outside the control of the state. You, you cease to be a responsible citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the mystic is not a responsible citizen. He's living in the presence of God. He doesn't give a damn about the, the state, the, the community. I would uh, say... That's why they're frightened of sex, because the sex sets you free. I would say that the Christians are more frightened of sex than the Jews. The Jews, I think yeah, that's probably yeah. true, yeah. yeah. Because in the Bible... Uh, sex is, uh, is not really anything bad, except, of course, you are not allowed to covet another man's wife, but at least you can covet your own wife or your own lover. In the Talmud, the same thing. Well, the greatest poem of sexual love is, is in the Bible, uh, in the, the, Bible. The, the Song of Solomon. Yes. And the Christians have had to uh, try and pretend that this is really an allegory of Christ's love for his church. So did the Jews. There's nothing, no, do they do that? Too? And how? Well, it's not true. I mean, this is a, this is a straight, a very beautiful, a very beautiful the, presentation of sexual emotion. There is one expression there where he speaks to a woman and he says, you are two breasts. I don't remember what he says yeah. about the breast. So the Talmud says, the two breasts means Moses and Aaron. That's and right. Aaron. Yeah. That's right. Yes. And there's even a Yiddish yeah. joke that a father comes into the kitchen uh, maybe I shouldn't even repeat it, and sees his son playing around with the maid, and says to him, my son, I send you to the yeshiva, and uh, you, you are playing around with the maid, with her bosom. He said, it's already an hour that I stay with her. I cannot make up which one is Moses and which one is that. <laughs> oh, it's lovely. I, I, I shouldn't say it. You I'm, should. I'm glad you said it. I didn't know that. I shouldn't say it on television. I think like, thy, thy navel <laughs> is like a goblet that yeah. matters not wine. Well, you, this, this has got to mean... Uh, Jesus Christ offering himself on the altar. The goblet is the chalice and the, uh, and the, and the moisture is the wine. And, and this is, no, it's a, a straightforward, beautiful, it's the most beautiful thing we have in English. The Jewish uh, uh, scholars mm. like, uh, like the Christian did the same thing. It is, a good trans it is a good translation, I think, in English that we have, the King James Version. I think, it's a, I think it's a good translation. Oh, oh, King James Version is, is a wonderful translation. Now they have new translations, you see, which try and kill the ecstasy. Oh. But what is it? Yes. Some of these new ones are really terrible. Have you, you, the New English Bible is awful. It's terrible. They're scared. We, in the old days, we say, vanity, vanity, says the preacher. But now we have emptiness, emptiness, says the Emptiness, it, emptiness. emptiness. It's vanity, 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 vanity. Vanity, vanity. It means, means vanity. 
some of these scholars, when they try to be very good, become very bad. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether to be... Uh, Mr Singer ironically says he's pessimistic, I suppose. Ironically, I can say I'm optimistic. And yeah. I don't believe the world is going to end. Uh, I think it's going to go on a long, long time. I think also that uh, mankind has a tremendous capacity for renewal. Uh, I don't see the population of the world growing any less. I think mankind is determined to survive. In spite of the atomic bomb? In spite of that. They will throw scores of atom bombs on people and others will have children and bring them up and be... Uh, I, I, this is I, I, how I foresee it. Mm. Mm. Actually, the Almighty tried to end the world in, in the flood. Yes. And if he did not succeed, I don't think that the atomic uh, scientists will, will, will manage to do it. Yes, I, I mean, yes. Uh, I don't know whether this is hopeful or hopeless, but I think ma mankind is going to go on for a long, long time. I call it hopeless. Well, it may be hopeless. We've, we've plenty of backsliding in front of us yet. Mm. Plenty of sin. Plenty of that. Plenty to look forward to. New sins, new ecstasies, new apocalypses. But love is a kind of sensualism, isn't it? <laughs> it's a big word. It's a big but, word. It means so many it things. Is, it means so many things. We know more or less what it is. It means so many things, especially in America. There was, a, there was a fellow Lancastrian of mine. He came from Liverpool. I come from Manchester, which is not far away, called John Lennon. And he was living in New York in the, that horrible block of flats, I think, called the Dakota Mansions. You remember? He was a young pop singer. Very popular. Uh, really. Never heard of well, he was, he, well, he was murdered. He was murdered. Oh, yes, he I murdered, murdered him. Uh, and uh, the young man who murdered him said, murdered, I, I, yeah. murdered, I murdered him because I loved him. This I know, yeah. So this, this I know. when we reach that stage, I murdered him because I loved him. I, I don't care to, uh, to discuss the word love anymore. I don't know what it means now. Mm. The word love has become much. a very cheap word. In my time, the word love meant something. Today, when you say with love... Uh, it's, it has, it has lost its meaning. Word, like in words, also there is such a thing as inflation. After, if after a word is used all the time, and for many purposes, it loses its meaning. But let's go back to the original meaning of the words from your youth. Love. Yes. In in in, in my in my time, when you loved somebody, it was a real. I mean, according to my father, who was a, a rabbi, he considered love a bad thing. I remember that my father forbade my sister to go to the Saxon garden, which, and, and, and they, my sister asked him why. He said, today are people fall in love. Mm -hmm. This was considered Falling love. Falling love is dangerous. Falling love is love. Yeah. Well, again, I think our trouble in English, with the English language, I think it's different in Hebrew, but... Uh, the English language has this one word which has to stand for so many things, but the Greeks had the two words, uh, eros and agape, yeah, yeah. which I think are very useful words. And uh, in, uh, if I may revert to that book again, you have St. Paul going around talking about agape and saying, down with eros. No more eros, let's no have agape eros, instead. Yes. Two different kinds of love. Yeah, I mean, highly religious people uh, among the Jews considered falling in love, giving in to emotions, giving in actually to the, to the desires of the body. So it, it, it was forbidden. One has to marry to a matchmaker because the matchmaker did so to say what destiny wanted him to do, while those who fall in love give in to, to, to passion. I would say there is great similar, similarity between all religions, whether they're Christian and, and Buddhist and so on. So it's a way of thinking of, of the human brain, but yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's more or less the same. Don't give in to the body too much. Do your duty, do what God has told you, and so on and so on. It, it never worked, really, and it still doesn't. So. Mm. Could one learn to think in a Jewish way as a Protestant? Or yes, you have to, I think. We have to. We have to. I think we have to. It's one of my deep, deep regrets that uh, I never had the opportunity to, uh, to embrace that faith which uh, contains Christianity. I think, so I think it's a bigger faith. It's a, this is a terrible thing to say in a Lutheran country, but I, think, I, always think, I always think the original Judaic philosophy is far bigger than anything we produced. 
chiefly because of these, uh, this tendency to divide, always dividing the God versus the devil, the body versus the soul. And uh, I always felt that in the Jewish religion, as far as I know it, there was a tendency to see life as a totality, which uh, the Christians have never been willing to do. It's a terrible thing to say in a Christian country, but I think it's true. They, they, the Christians gave to the devil a more of a... Well, they gave more, they gave, they gave more they gave, importance. They gave more importance to the Gave him a the larger devil. role, so yeah. to say. So we have to learn to think in a Jewish way. I don't think it's a bad idea. If you have nothing else to do, try this. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's, let's end. Duck. Was <laughs> good. It was a pleasure. It was a special pleasure to listen to great this gentleman. Great pleasure for me. Great, great pleasure. I didn't. I didn't know we were being recorded. We were being recorded all the time. All the time. Yeah, no, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. I know. That's good. That's good television. It was, it that's, was, good. that's good it television. Was good for me. Yes, I'm good. sorry. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't do as you wanted. No, it's better. It's better not to know, really. Yeah, no, no. Better, you wanted me to be alone. And, and, oh, no, no. I was absolutely happy to to listen.